Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning service at the West Side Church of Christ uh, online edition. We are going to beginning a new sermon series this morning. We began, we already preached it at the uh, live service at 1015 at the church building, but it's when it's too much, when life is too much, what is the Christian response? And if you normally don't, but... Um, I would encourage this. If you could follow along in your Bibles, at least for this morning's lesson, um, it would probably help. And if you don't uh, feel comfortable going through the Bible, if you could just look up for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I think that would help a lot in this morning's lesson when we get to the sermon time. I hope that you're having a great week. I hope the Omicron variant is not disturbing your life very much. Our family uh, went through a little bit of it uh, over the Christmas holidays, but we're coming through the other side and we're thankful for that. And we know a lot of people have been struggling with it lately and we're continuing to pray for them. Some people we know are in the hospital with it and everything else. And so we want to keep everybody, especially our neighbors, our community, our leaders in our prayers. But anyways, as we've done, we're going to do again this week. It's great to see you. It's great that you have allowed us to be part of your, your week's beginning. And we're going to play a few songs. You can sing along with them if you know them, or you can allow them to guide the meditation of your heart. Again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hold the way, my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divine is comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know, whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know, whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Hold the way, my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, all the fullness of His love, perfect rest to me is promised. In my Father's house above, when my spirit clothed in mortal wings is flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Step alone. 
nice thoughts for us to enter into our worship together. Um, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight. And that's really the hope that we have, isn't it? Is that one day everything's going to be made right and we're going to see King Jesus just as glorious as he is. So we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 39. And if you're not comfortable flipping around in your Bibles, if you could look up 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, I think that will help you as we go through today's uh, lesson, which is the first part of a series we're going to talk about when, when life gets too much, when we feel too overwhelmed, when we feel too burdened or overburdened. And what do we make of the statement when people say, God will not give you more than you can handle? And, and, and at times it definitely feels like it is more than we can handle. So what do we make with that statement? And we're going to discuss that statement. We're not just going to uh, take it as true, but we're actually going to discuss the statement and actually question whether or not the statement should be said. So the line between courage and foolishness is not always easy to discern. And in Genesis chapter 39, we have this really well-known account of uh, Joseph, who is one of the great uh, fathers of Israel, you know, um, and, and, and a great hero of the Old Testament faith in Genesis 39. And we have this famous account of him and his master's uh, wife. His master's name was Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. And, and you, you remember the story, perhaps, where Potiphar's wife uh, wants Joseph to sleep with her, to commit adultery with her, and Joseph continually refuses. And the romantic image of being able to stand tough can be dangerously close to acting the fool rather than the courageous one when it comes to temptation to sin. Because we notice in Joseph's ordeal that when Potiphar's wife makes the seduction or makes the invitation, it's not simply a one-time trial. Now, Joseph has been sold into Egypt by his brothers. Life uh, for most people, including Joseph, has gone tremendously south. But we notice that Joseph is blessed tremendously compared to what he could have been. It's not the ideal life, but he's still blessed compared to what he could have been. See, in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 39, you'll notice how often the Lord is mentioned alongside the circumstances of Joseph. It says in verse 4 that Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So, so Joseph is in a bad situation, uh, a desperate situation, but he's blessed tremendously compared to what it could have been. But often, as we know in life, with blessings come temptations and trials. And Potiphar's wife tempts him by inviting him. It's not only an invitation, but in, in, even in our world, we know this is a, a brutal truth. It's an invitation by someone who has power over them, who's in a position of power. And it says in verse 7, after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Joseph valiantly refuses. It says in verse 8, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, Joseph refuses. And this is actually rare in Scripture, especially up to this point, that a man will put obedience to God ahead of gratifying passion. But Joseph does it. But it's, it's actually rare. And I'm sure Joseph hoped it would be one and done, that it was just a one-time thing and it would be over with, but it isn't. It says in verse 10, And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day. 
he would not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. And so day after day, she continually invites Joseph. She continually tempts Joseph. The seduction to do evil in the form of pleasure. And if you know the story, you know what happens is that one day it comes to a head and Joseph is caught. She catches Joseph by his garment and he runs away. And the story goes that she has to somehow explain why she has the garment in her hand and the one in power gets the benefit of the doubt as opposed to the oppressed one and she accuses Joseph of trying to force himself onto her. And so the question I have is, why does Joseph run? He, he refuses her day after day, but why does he run? And there are times a need to escape temptation rather than foolishly stand in it. Courage is the ability to run at times and know that the image of standing tough is not proper or could lead you somewhere that you do not want to go. Why does Joseph run? Because there are times that the way to escape temptation is to run fully away from it. We want to begin this new year with a series that is led by the Apostle Paul concerning the popular saying today that God won't give you more than you can handle. This is a phrase that is so popular in modern culture, especially among those who have, a, have an inkling of faith, that we hear it, we say it. In fact, it is, it is so popular, it becomes a part of us. It becomes so ingrained that it is never questioned. We wouldn't think to question it because we simply hear it so often, say it so often, believe in it so much that it must be true. Even if situations arise in our lives that might make us want to question it normally, we use that statement to tamper down the questions. I am so stressed out, but I know God will not give me more than I can handle. And on and on it goes. Sermons can be preached eloquently using it. It comes from a place of Christian concern. We use the phrase to comfort, to teach, to guide, to counsel, to soothe. The phrase is meant to convey that hope is in the air even when we are in the direst of circumstances. But where does it come from? Where does the phrase, God will not give us more than we can handle, come from? We want to look at that statement closely enough to maybe understand what is Paul's advice for us in situations where we finally might be tempted to cry, this is too much. The phrase is actually a popular paraphrase from our reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. In that verse, Paul says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So that's where the, the idea comes from. There's some great encouraging words from Paul there, and we at least can see the connection between the apostles' praise of God and our popular phrase. But before we begin, one of the things we always need to do, and usually we're, we're good at it, I'm not saying we're not, is we want to be clear is what words mean in their context. And so for an example, when you see the word seal, S-E-A-L, what does it mean? And the word seal can mean a an aquatic mammal, uh, that cute, lovable thing that sometimes we go to shows to see, but... but that lives in the ocean, right? This A seal. But it can also mean an emblem, right? That he sealed it with his seal, right? It can also mean something that prevents leakage uh, around the bathtub. You put a seal. And of course, it can also mean the popular, at one time, uh, singer, musician named Seal. So Seal, truthfully, means all of these, 
but it doesn't mean all of them in each use. What it means in a specific use depends on the context. And so Paul says in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And in the context, or the word temptation, first of all, is just kind of like our word seal. Temptation can mean a trial of any kind that when we enter reveals either good or, or bad, stuff that needs to be worked on. But it also can mean, depending on its use, a temptation to sin, a temptation to do carnal immorality. And I think this will help us understand the phrase if we try to narrow it in its context that God won't give you more than you can handle. Unfortunately, commentaries, if you look them up and if you're used to it, are divided on this. They, some will provide other things. But I think if you follow the commentaries when they use it, you'll see that they have to then um, do something with the other words in the verse that Paul uses. When used in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the context of temptation is temptation to sin, to te temptation to engage in moral or immorality. And like Joseph had, Paul is promising that anytime there's a temptation to sin, there's an opportunity to escape. There's always an opportunity to escape. The word escape is illuminating in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That there's no temptation that God will not also provide a way of escape. We don't have to make an extra definition of escape if we understand what temptation means there. In this context, this is both good news and instructive for us, is that we will never be tempted to sin beyond our ability. And the emphasis here is important that he, God, will provide a way of escape so that we can endure it. Even in this text, we notice a couple of things that helps us with the phrase that God won't give you more than you can handle because, first of all, you'll notice it is not God who has given you the temptation. It's not saying that God will not tempt you beyond what you are able. It's, it's not that God has given you more than you are able. In James 1 and verse 13, James, the writer, says, Let no one say when they are tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. The temptation you have is not given to you by God. In fact, James will say in verse 17, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. It is not God who has given you the temptation, but it is God who is limiting it. And I believe we find strength in this. God is handling both the severity and the resolution of our temptation. God limits it, and God provides a way of escape. That's fascinating. And this is important when we think about temptation to sin. Now, in the greater context of 1 Corinthians 10, notice what Paul writes there. Just before verse 13, Paul is giving his readers a warning. Let anyone who thinks they stand take heed lest they fall. I want you to do something for me. I want you to think about, if you can, I know it's hard sometimes, but think over the times when you've done things you didn't want to do, when you've done things you aren't proud of, when you've fallen. And when do they usually occur? What is your attitude prior before? What is your, your feeling prior before falling? And falling for me usually occurs when I fail to heed the warning from Paul. I'm confident. I'm, I'm confident in myself too much. Paul reminds us to take heed. Let anyone who thinks they stand, lest they fall. But Paul reminds us in verse 13 that temptation is actually routine. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common. 
it stops the reasoning of falling. It stops the self-excuse for falling to something like this. What would anyone else have done in my shoes? Who would have been able to bear what I bore? Paul says that none are uniquely tempted by sin. It's common to humanity. Secondly, God is for us. God, you know, we always have to ask the question. I think it's good to ask the question, what's God's role in this situation? Well, God's on our side. In this verse, we notice how God is working on our behalf. Temptation to commit any sin might cause us to believe we are powerless, but it doesn't make it so. God's on our side because God is always providing a way of escape. Like Joseph, there's a way to resist and there's a way to escape. But the kicker is that we can choose to ignore God's assistance. We can choose to not take the way of escape. We can even choose to believe the lie that we are powerless to resist. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the context is, idol worship and all of the things that go along with it, he brings up the Israelites of old early on, and you'll notice the symbolism he uses of Christian baptism in the Lord's Supper. All were baptized into Moses, he says in verse 2. All ate the same spiritual food in verse 3. All drank the same spiritual drink in verse 4. Uh, it gushed from the rock, and it was Christ, and so on. We notice the symbolism that he uses, that all of them were baptized, all of them ate spiritual food, all of them drank spiritual drink, but despite this, with most of them, God was not well pleased. So Paul says, don't desire evil like they did. How did they desire evil? They engaged in idolatry and sexual immorality. They grumbled. And this is the warning from Paul. That this temptation to sin, Israel's flirtation with idol worship, led to debauchery and drastic consequences. So right after verse 13, when he talks about providing a way of escape, and in reminiscence of Joseph, he says in verse 14, flee from idolatry. This is what's really on Paul's mind here when he writes this. This isn't beyond your ability. Flee from idolatry. So in the context of temptation to sin, the statement God will not give us more than we can handle needs to be handled with care, that statement. Because first, as we pointed out, it's not God who gives us the temptation to sin, but it's God who gives us the way of escape. It's God who gives us the ability to handle any temptation that comes our way by providing the way of escape. The end conclusion is that any sin I commit, whether it's idolatry, sexual immorality, or grumbling, or anything, is something that I must take responsibility for. There's no situation that made it too strong for me to resist. Now, considering a broader thought that we're going to spend the next few weeks on, what do we do when we find ourselves overwhelmed? Not by temptation to sin, but by life and its situations. And how do we move on in this situation? And what do we do with phrases like, God won't give us more than we can handle? What happens when we find ourselves too burdened in life? I want to share with you four thoughts. We're not going to dive too much into this, but this is where we're going to begin next week. First of all, statements that are true, but stated flippantly, do not help. And that even includes scripture. You know, when someone is overwhelmed and someone else says, well, all things work together for good. But if it's said flippantly, without any real empathy, 
it doesn't really do any help. Most of the times, people who have been involved with God already know those statements. So, so, so it's not simply a restatement of it in a flippant fashion. Secondly, bumper sticker statements that we might be tempted to equate with Scripture need to be really investigated because they may give misguided information. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Investigate that statement. Let's ask the questions, what does God give us? Is it true we can handle everything that comes our way? Is it wrong to feel overwhelmed? Is being overwhelmed part of the list of the works of the flesh? Investigate that. What is it that God gives? Thirdly, why is there an association between struggles and God? Why is there an association between the origin of struggles being God? And the fourth thing, and maybe we can chew on this for a week before we get into more of what Paul has to say, is that God is not the burden giver, but the burden bearer. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, beginning in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God is not the burden giver. And God is not the burden. God is the burden bearer, casting all your anxieties upon him. So I'm not answering everything yet, but we're going to pick it up next week. But what do we do about this idea that God is not going to give us more than we can handle? And I think the most important question in settling this is going, to answer, is going to be answering the question, what is God's role when we find ourselves overwhelmed? Instead of leading with our answer that God will not give us more than we can handle, let's ask the question, what's God's role when we find ourselves overwhelmed? In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 8, and we're just going to end with this verse here, Paul says, We do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Do you hear what Paul says? We were overwhelmed beyond our strength. We had more than we could handle. So what is God's role? And it's going to be an encouraging one, I promise you. Dread not the things that are ahead The word and strength of sinking sands The thorns that o'er the path are spread God holds a future in Lift close to him and trust 
that's an important truth, isn't it? That God holds the future in his hands. In Matthew chapter 26, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he sat down with his disciples at a very special moment in time, and he had such desire to eat the Passover with the disciples, the great memorial feast of the lamb that was slaughtered so that the Israelites could be redeemed, that the blood of the lamb redeemed the Israelites and ushered them out of Egypt in the great exodus. Well, a greater Passover was coming, and it was Jesus, the lamb, who was going to shed his blood so that we could be redeemed and the angel of death would pass over us and we would live forever, right? We would have an exodus out of the life of sin and death and darkness. And in Matthew 26, when he's setting up the Lord's Supper, he takes bread, he breaks it, and he gives it to the disciples, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. And then he takes a cup, and when he gave it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so, on every first day of the week, we're invited by the living Jesus to take this, his body, and take this, his blood, and remember the, the Passover lamb, Jesus, offering his body and shedding his blood for us, for his church. And so we would understand always the great price, the great redemption, that Jesus uh, did for us. Bow with me for the bread, please. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his body, which was broken on the cross. Bless this bread as we partake it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Pray with me for the fruit of the vine. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, you watch over us. We're thankful for Jesus and the blood that he shed in which our sins are washed away. It is through Christ's name we pray. Amen. We certainly want to uh, keep so many people in our prayers. I appreciate all the prayers that were offered on me and my family's behalf. And we are, are through COVID now, and but we know so many others uh, of our relatives, friends, and neighbors. It's almost impossible to list them all who, who are struggling with it. And so we want to keep our, our community, our world in our prayers um, as we go through this. We also want to continue to remember Victor Vasilevsky in our prayers. He's progressing well. He's making good progress, working on his neck now and everything. So we want to keep Victor and Olga in our prayers. We're thankful for that. We want to keep Liam Whitfield in our prayers. That's Mike and Jan Kent's uh, great nephew who's nine years old. He did have the bone marrow transplant, and he and his father now are in isolation for 100 days while they recoup, and we pray um, that things will go well uh, from here on out for them. We want to keep the family of Brian Burningham in our prayers. That is Rick and Elizabeth's good friend. He did attend uh, Westside on Wednesday nights for a number of months. And um, his wife, Gail, of course, we want to remember her in our prayers. Uh, Brian did pass away. He had a, a lengthy uh, battle with his health. And uh, so we do want to keep the Burningham family in our prayers. Uh, please bow with me for a final word. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, that you are the God of all comfort. We're thankful that you are the God of all grace. And we pray, Father, that you be with everyone that we've mentioned, but we especially pray that you be with the Burningham family. Let them know, Father, that he is in your care, that you are the one who is guiding his future. Bless us always, Father. It is through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone.